Today's podcast is brought to you by Ryan, a leading global tax service and software provider that helps companies manage and minimize property taxes from acquisition to disposition and all points in between. As the firm with the most local market property tax professionals across the country, Ryan has experience in nearly every jurisdiction, unmatched by any other national, regional, or local provider. Welcome to NREI's Common Area Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning editorial staff at NREIOnline.com. Let's jump right into this week's podcast. Hello and welcome to the Common Area with your host, David Bodemer. David, how are you today? I'm doing uh, well, hunker down. Uh, how are you? I, I hear you're under blankets. I mean, not, you know, the fuzzy <laughs> kind, the, the white kind. You got a ton of snow there, right? Yeah, big, I think the biggest snowstorm that we've had, um, I, 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 bigger than anything we had last year. So it, it does look kind of nice. It's pretty peaceful out there. So that's nice. We, we all need that fresh start. Uh, I know that you brought a guest on the show today. Why don't you go ahead and do the intro? Yes. So today we have with us Matt Pestronk, who is the co founder and president of Post Brothers. Uh, hi, Matt. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. How are you? You know, before we kind of dive into the meat of it, could you just um, give our listeners, for anyone that's not aware, a bit of a, a primer on Post Brothers and and, um, sure. and your background? Yep, yep, no problem. Post Brothers is a 15-year-old uh, vertically integrated multifamily and mixed-use development and asset management company focused on uh, urban and infill projects on the East Coast, headquartered in Philadelphia, about 3,000 operating units, um, 1,000 units under construction, and a substantial future development pipeline. Okay. So, yeah, the, the, that's, you know, right, right there, just given the focus of what your company does is the reason that I was interested in talking to you just because, you know, 2020, one of the, you know, there have been all these narratives as, as we're all aware of you know, what's going to change forever about commercial real estate and what are these huge, you know, some of these shifts and like, is the office dead and et cetera. I'm sure, you know, we've all, we've all heard these a lot now. Yeah. Uh, and, one, and one of them is this question of urban versus suburban and like, are people, so given your position and, and post brother position and the kind of product that you do, you know, I'm very curious just to hear what you've been seeing and what you think, you know, about what we're going to see as we actually see the, you know, the vaccinations are happening right now every day and yeah. uh, that's going to accelerate. So like, we're not talking about theoretical anymore. We're talking about what, what are things going to look like within, within like six to 12 months now. So how do we kind of come out of this and what, what are some of the takeaways? I don't know. That's a lot, lot for me to throw at you all at once. No, and we, I, kinda, I, we can kind of break it down. I'm, I'm flattered that you are asking me my opinion as someone who has direct frontline experience with what's happening with these issues at the vanguard of commercial real estate in cities on a daily basis. Um, I wish the article in Bloomberg Business Week that, that was published today, I wish they would have called me to interview me. Um, I will tell you what I don't think is going to happen. I don't think millennials are going to move en masse to places two hours from major cities because housing costs are so much lower and companies believe they can be universally productive remotely. Um, I think the opposite of that is true. I've been in commercial real estate for 20 years. Uh, three black swan events have happened. The first one was when I started in the business. It was the uh, it was, it was sort of a, a, a trifecta, unfortunately, that brought the commercial real estate market to a tough place. So it was the Russian bond defaults, the internet bubble, and the uh, bursting and stock market crashing and 9-11 happening in about 36 months. But 9-11 crashing brought the commercial real estate market to a really tough place in cities. Um, because people were naturally afraid of terrorist attacks. And the internet was not as prevalent today, then as it was today, 
because uh, I mean, just uh, broadband was much narrower. So you didn't have an overload of information. But I will tell you that people thought that commercial real estate in cities generally was uh, was 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 uh, going to be severely impacted. Turned out to be not the case at all. Every city in America has had a 20 year run since then. Um, and, you know, I think what's happening on the backside of COVID as we get out of this is actually um, a reaction to something that we'll, we can talk about later, which was cities becoming so expensive and uh, residents, people getting such a uh, feeling they were getting such little value for their money in terms of quality of life that the overreaction from COVID it was a byproduct of that. So, so, so since 9-11, there's been a 20 year run after people thought cities were in real trouble. Then the GFC happened and I worked in New York at the time and people thought the economy was dead, Wall Street was dead, there would be no more commercial mortgage backed securities mm -hmm. and that um, no one would produce commercial real estate ever again. And there are, I find myself in being 43 years old, not, I still tend to think of myself as a new young person every day and coming at a young person in the business and I'm really not. And there are a few people who remember either, there are less people in the business. I believe more than 50% of the people involved in commercial real estate, uh, certainly those facing the investment and development and ownership side of commercial real estate, I believe less than 50% of them were in the business uh, during the great financial crisis. Wow. So a lot of them don't remember that they've only had a good market because we've had a good market for 10 years and black swan events are black swan events and human beings are human beings. You can't collaborate in person with colleagues. You can't network. You can't meet um, someone spontaneously have a, you know, have a domestic partnership or get married or anything like that. Uh, if you're existing remotely and if you're living in some tiny town, there's nothing wrong with that. I happen to, there are a number of small places I like, but as an, an aggressively, um, as the owner of an aggressively expanding business, I can't live in a, a small a uh, pretty rural town and grow a capital intensive urban real estate development business. And neither can the people that work for me and neither can anyone in our entire supply chain or vendors. And I'll just put it simply, like people think they can run businesses productively over Zoom. The first time I feel like there's no added risk to get on a plane and go make the pitch in person for whatever it is I want to do, I'm going to do it. And the other person who's, who doesn't do that is going to lose and I'm going to win. Generally, I'd like to think I'm going to win anyway. But um, if we're both in person, anyway, the, the point is that, it, you know, um, cities are cities for a reason. And there was the, the last pandemic, 1918 influenza, there was no, obviously no, option to telework with, you know, even electricity, forget about a computer or a phone for people, but cities came back and that flu spread because of horrible health conditions, which really don't, health conditions for everyone are better. Obviously there's some very unfortunate inequality, which, um, you know, as a business, we're committed solving, which I can touch on in a minute, but um, I don't think that, I don't, I, I don't think that this pandemic will really damage cities. You know, commercial real estate in cities, especially the ones that got wildly expensive, will probably, you know, be a little soft for two or three years, but maybe less. That's what happens. But I'm not, I'm not, I, I just 
think the characteristics of our urban centers have too much going for them to see just a shift in dynamic. And, and then the, the subject of, when you read a lot of these things that are written and they're quite extensive with examples that are sort of not particularly, not widely applicable to how most people live their lives. I think that that just makes the example like that much more clear. Like if you work for a tech company and you work on a computer all day and you have no aspiration for upward mobility by networking with your superiors, I suppose that you can just move to you know, an extremely rural place if you want to and exist over a computer. But I, that's certainly not that much of America and none of my workforce and not much of the workforce in any major cities. And all the fangs, or maybe not Apple, Facebook, Google, those people have massive and expanding real estate footprints in Manhattan. Right. And if Facebook could certainly pay to terminate the lease they just signed for the Farley Post Office, they have the money to do it. Haven't heard they're planning to do that. So um, I, am, I am an optimist at the highest level on the yeah. rebound. I think uh, yeah, I think that's actually been a pretty big tell during this whole year that all these tech companies, while they've been at the forefront of like you know we're not going to bring our workforces back until June, July, you know, or you know sometime in the spring or or, or summer of 2021. At the same time, they're signing the, they're 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 snatching up the spaces that that's becoming available. There was the space in in Hudson Yards, you know, that was the Neiman Marcus that's now going to be. I think I think I can't remember. I think Facebook grabbed that one. I can't remember actually now or Amazon. One of them. there's so many of these deals that have been happening in New York City um, that these tech companies have been, have been have been signing. So I feel like that's a pretty big indication of, you know, even if things may look different or the density may be different, that the idea that that we're not going to have people working in cities is is definitely doesn't seem you know i don't think it's true i mean i live in brooklyn i've lived in new york city you're the, the the time frame that you're talking about is exactly the same time frame that i've been covering this industry i moved to new york city in 99 and i've been covering you know commercial real estate for about 20 years so i've covered i've written about all those things and and i think that's why so my perspective is around this is pretty close to yours around like you know we've seen you know some pretty significant setbacks but through that time i've also seen new york city just become um, you know, just be the, the place that I, that I want to live in. And, 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 and my wife and I have talked about like, not, a, you know, even though we've for the past nine months been stuck in Brooklyn and not able to enjoy all of the things that we have always loved about New York, it's just made well, us want to do those things more. And the idea of uh, leaving New York city without being able to re-experience a lot of that stuff, is not something that, appeal to us personally, you know, like we kind of want to get back to enjoying that stuff before maybe thinking about moving out of the city. So I kind of, so I agree with a lot of what you said. One, I guess a question though, then that is, and, and I also think it could be a good thing if you know, we've had an affordability crisis in, in New York. Um, and so rents coming down some is I think also a good thing in terms of me making it more affordable for creatives or for, for, for millennials or for young Gen Z to be able to come in and live in the city and, and be part of that lifeblood again. So I think, I guess the question is, what have you seen in your portfolio for rents and what does that mean? Like, and how much of a, can you, can you tolerate some, some softness around rents and still like make the deals pencil out? Well, um, so I would say we tend to be, we have a reputation, we have a real, real estate developers by nature are, are optimistic. Mm -hmm. and That's totally true. <laughs> open to risk. However, very good real estate developers, which, you know, I'd like, I'd like to think we fall into that category are excellent managers of risk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're seeing, we underwrite every project such that it, you know, we can with, withstand a significant diminution in rental income, whether that comes in the form of 
you know, reduced based rents or reduced occupancy, that's sort of just, it's all the same. You're hoping to get a dollar and you're getting 80 cents. We're, we're getting, you know, we're getting 80 cents and that's what's happening now. Um, we're fine. But when you choose to take a capital structure on a project that requires you to uh, not have such a margin of safety in order to be successful, um, I think that I think that or, or you're in an asset class that just fundamentally you did everything right. But like if nobody's staying in a hotel and you have no debt on it, right. you have a problem right. where the multifamily industry Depending on, 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 we have like 14 assets that are operating right now, 14 operating assets or 11, because uh, three are more commercial. Depending on exactly the niche they occupy in the market, the best ones have are doing better because they're class A, but a little value oriented. They're, they're sort of value oriented and they're on the, on the edge of the, of the, of a, on the edge of the city and the suburbs. And then the highest end class A properties we have um, have had a mixed bag. The, the exact thing we're seeing is that the aspirational one bedroom renter who it, our product is, is aspirational. It's generally, generally sets the high rent bar and are the best assets in every sub market where they're located. So um, the aspirational one bedroom renter, probably single person who's, you know, a striver in their career, that person has pulled back. Um, so the traffic for that kind, for the sort of more expensive one bedroom apartment is down. That is exactly where we're seeing the effect of this pandemic. That person is saying, I don't have any aspect of my 2019 life back and I'm not getting any benefit of living in the city and I'm going to live at home. And that is the thing we're seeing. There's no, nobody's, I mean, we, we keep track of these things on a granular level. We had less people move to the smile States and Texas and Florida than before. Than, than previous years who moved out. We, give an, we get an exit interview from everybody. Collection, the collection, collections are not an issue. People just want their 2019 life back. I know I do, David. Yeah. I think I heard you say you did. Yeah. So, but, but then in the larger unit types where two and three bedrooms where you tend to have you know, people who have you know, married or formed households already, they're, they're not moving in with... you know significant others parents under under any scenario other than forced to economically and luckily um, in the white collar industries and the markets we're in that's not been the case so the two and three bedrooms have held up better we're actually seeing rental increases there and the one the ones in the studios are uh, where the softness is but like there's still traffic traffic's picked up it's actually traffic was higher in in late september october november sitting in the same period last year we had more to rent in some properties because we you know taken a dive when people were panicked starting in march they were giving notices to vacate in march and april and that's 60 days out so we sort of bottomed out June, July, we had a bunch of assets go from, we had a couple assets finishing lease up that went from around look, touching 90% or better to the mid to high 60s. And I would tell you that by this March, I think they're going to be right back to where they were. So, I mean, I'm just, unlike the people who have PhDs in urban studies and work in uh, urban planning and are writing about these things for Business Week and studying what they believe to be macro trends. I unfortunately only have a very narrow view on the ground, but my view is a mile deep, but a foot wide. So 
Um, but cities where you've had massive housing affordability issues, and I'd say it's really two to three in this country, right, that have some geographical constraints that nobody talks about. Like Manhattan can't grow. You can't, can't build anything. You know, there's very, very few sites you can build. So. By water. And, and San Francisco is also the same thing. And water and I think like hills and mountains and insane traffic and the city is tiny. And like, so I think, I, I think it's good. I think, you know, municipal governments have not done much to stimulate the production of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really think there's a, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I want to, um, just talk a little bit, a little bit about how I think the affordable housing issue may be the thing that is driving flight from certain cities, right. and then the real that's driving that narrative, that this broad narrative, and then like we should, I'd like to talk about what I think the underlying problem is. So, like, if you're paying, if you're a single person, you're paying a ton of money and you have a small space that you live in and you have a relatively not great paying job and you lived in the city because of it, the you know cultural and entertainment things that are not available. You felt like, why, it's just like, why am I, I mean, I lived in New York, like, and, you know, I said, what. Well, why I would I I might say not I would stay if I was single, but a fair number of people are saying I'm not getting value for this. I'm moving, but I'm going to come back, right? And so um, not getting value is a is a problem. That is because cities have done very little to stimulate affordable housing production. But candidly, I would tell you a lot of big cities in America. Um, New York included have poverty problem, not not a not an affordability problem, and the poverty problem um, uh, like it causes then the middle class in certain cities to have stress to be re to become rent burdened because there's so many resources going to people that are extremely poor. Philadelphia has um, does not have um, uh, a problem with naturally occurring affordable housing existing, nor do many cities. I know New York and San Francisco are different, but just talking about, um, and so Philadelphia doesn't have housing uh, burdens for uh, rental burden uh, widely existing for the middle class. It has an affordability problem. It has, a, it has a poverty. Philadelphia, other cities have a poverty problem. And the poverty problem is is in a way uh, driven by land use. Land use is myopic and hyper local, meaning an elected representative of a district and a municipality controls in every city. In Philadelphia, in New York, I don't think they actually use the term councilmanic prerogative. In Philadelphia, that's what it's called, where other members of a legislature typically. Um, a legislative body, i.e. A city, a city council has to vote on um, land being zoned for more or less density or a change of use. Generally, in, in ev almost every legislative body everywhere, you see other members defer to the district representative who's, who control, who is elected, uh, the elected official who represents the district where the proposed legislation for rezoning is put forth. Whatever that person votes, the other city council people defer to them. And the reason is um, when, when they, the other city council people want deference or prerogative or when they have a project, everyone to vote for their proposed legislation. And I don't want to use the word quid pro quo because I'm not trying to make a political, I'm not trying to frame a political narrative particularly. So the problem is you have places that, ha that don't have 
uh, that are that are underzoned and could support more density. If you could then unlock the density, you could employ people trapped in uh, chronic poverty in the construction trade, in the construction industry. The construction industry being a, still, a skilled construction worker is a path to the middle class. It's a path to owning a home. It's a path to having health insurance, et cetera. And um, unfortunately, our, our affordable housing um, model in this country um, is federally mandated land use. Like I just described is local. The federal model is a, I'd say a, a, a limited subsidy sort of charity model. You know, people have mm -hmm. called it welfare in the past. I don't really like that term, but that's what it is. And therefore it's just a cost and therefore it's not scalable. If you created a private sector solution to the pro poverty problem, which would, would be massively upzoning certain parts of cities, you could employ people who are poor in the construction trades, and then they would not be poor anymore because they would have a profession. It is, we have, we've done that in Philadelphia where we've gotten projects rezoned and then taken, uh, we've take, taken people who live in adjacent neighborhoods who are, you know, by um, unfortunately trapped in a uh, generational, generational cyclical chronic poverty and gotten them apprentice jobs with our subcontractors on our projects. And they went from the best job they could get was $12 an hour to, you know, $19, $18 an hour with benefits and a path to, uh, you know, making twice that within a couple of years. And then suddenly you have so many more possibilities and so um, that's, that is, um, you know. So it's like a, a governance issue rather than um, a sub, like a real estate supply issue. I'm really not trying to say that the government is causing. People. No, no, I'm not, you know, but, but that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, but you're talking about zoning, but you know, you're talking about, you're talking about policy. Um, yeah, it's a very, very bad. Well, it's actually not policy. It's it's legislation. Mm -hmm. It's it it, it 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 should be policy. <clears throat> policy is every city. Every city in America has a planning department full of highly qualified people mm -hmm. that has absolutely no power. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny um, it, it, because there's what should happen, and then there's like what gets voted to happen in in you know legislative bodies. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a governance issue, correct? Um, just to switch gears, I mean, that, that you know, you laid out a lot there um, that I, I think that was extremely interesting. But I, we are limited time. But I, but one other thing I wanted to ask you about, um, yep. which is just you know, given the um you know the year that we've had and the and 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 where we are and where things are becoming how what are your communications like with your own investors and and who are your investors and 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 how and how are you kind of navigating them through this whole process sure um our investors are um are uh institutional uh limited partners mm -hmm. and institutional scale family offices um, so they tend to be very interested in what's happening. There's typically not an intermediary or a, an allocator between us and our capital. We raise directly from limited partners. Um, I can tell you, so in the beginning, constant communication, um, we sent out, um, sent out frequent investor communications. Luckily, we're in the multifamily asset class. A lot of our investors are in other asset classes with other managers and sponsors. And so they are generally um, not greatly concerned about multifamily. This year is not going to be profitable across the board, but it's not going to be money losing either in a substantial way, luckily, at a lot of our assets. So um, you know, that's, that's 
in this environment, that's probably a win. And so they're, uh, they're, you know, they're waiting for, uh, you know, better days. And so are we. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. I, I, you know, one of our sister publications is, um, we're actually be about to, um, this will be communicated to the market as well, but we're, we're, we're about to reposition ourselves slightly to, because our sister publication is a wealth management publication that does talk to financial advisors. And we're also, you know, touches on the high net worth of family office space. So that is interesting. We're, we're pretty unique in that that is what drives our investor base. And even the institutional investors that we have really are, um, in fact, um, MFO, like say it's, I would say multifamily offices. Mm -hmm. They're aggregating money from a couple clients. Right. And I know, I know the underlying clients. So um, our investors are all people. Um, you know, if you have enough capital that you have, can have a family office staffed with investment professionals, you know, they're generally, definitionally, there's a certain amount of money you have to have to right. have that. So our investor base is really even unique in that space in that they're in the family office space, they call it uh, 1G, meaning first generation, the person mm -hmm. who made the money. So um, these people, I think uh, those investors are uh, themselves, they did something in their careers that no one else had done before in order to, you know, cause, what would say a disruption. They found a unique angle doing something to be able to make, you know, an enormous amount of money in their lifetimes. And definitionally, those people are not risk averse. Um, but there's all different kinds of family offices and the 1G people in range in age from, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg, who we have, we don't have any business with at all, but he's known to be investing in real estate. They can range from that age to 90 years old. And they have, you know, many different, they can have lots of different uh, perspectives on the market. And then um, when you get to second and third generation and beyond family offices, uh, those people tend to not not permanently, but you see a lot more discretionary decision-making by professional uh, investment managers within the family office. Um, and they're right now, those people, those kinds of investors are being very cautious because assuming the, um, um, assuming that um, those, uh, people have sold the wealth generating business that created the wealth, um, right? Oftentimes you'll have 1G people that are still doing something right. like they're so, a hedge yeah. fund manager or, or, you know, they have a main business and they're going to be the decision maker almost always. They have investment professionals and financial analysts and CFOs and, the, the people you would need to run any kind of successful investment enterprise, but the one G's are pretty much always the decision makers. They're, you know, uh, less risk averse, less concerned right now. Um, but the two G's, three G's, they're a little bit more concerned about the performance of real estate in the short term, primarily because you know, the family's primary means of income typically is the investment portfolio. Right. That being said, they can't make, no one, they can't make heads or tails of the stock market. The bond market is, is, you know, can't keep up with, the bond market is not a good place for family office wealth to be concentrated. Um, they don't, they don't really want to be there right now for, for, you know, given where rates are. And so that leaves real estate right. um, and it doesn't mean they, they all want to do it, but I'd say want to invest. Um, I think they're all favorably inclined. I think generally family offices right now, if they have the ability to be liquid in cash, 
that's what they're, that is where a lot of them are sitting right now. Um, but you know, there's some FOMO about getting out of the stock if you're <laughs> missing out of right, right. another run up in the stock market. So it's, it, it, it's complicated. Well, it's all, this is all extremely fascinating. I could, um, but we are, I think we're, we're limited on time. So I may have to bring you back to discuss, discuss, I mean, and then all these things that we're talking about are all going to be ongoing things. So, you know, maybe we can touch base in six months or, or so about what's, you know, what we're seeing in the cities or, um, yeah. talking about what, what you're dealing with family offices. I, I, I love to hear about all this stuff, but I, um, you know, but you know, one last thing, I guess, is, uh, is anything that we didn't touch on at all that, that, um, you wanted to, to leave the audience with? No, I really appreciate you having me. I, I really enjoyed this. And, um, I, I, I would tell everyone do not bet against cities. Well, that's, that sounds, that sounds like a good, a good way to end. Um, so I appreciate you very much, you know, coming on and, and, you know, sharing all the, all your insights with our audience and with me and, and, um, you know, and, and I'm sure, um, you know, Eric, you, uh, have any, any, uh, anything you want to add? Well, I'll tell you what, I, I do have one thing I want to add. I want Matt back. Right. I mean, here's the thing is that, uh, Matt, you were so positive. I mean, it, what a positive outlook on uh, the cities and what's going on there, um, what the future possibly could hold. I mean, we don't know, right? We don't know what we don't know at this point, but um, I love the fact that you were very, very positive about it and you come in with a very positive attitude. So um, I'm hoping that David, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to bug David in six months and, and say, hey, let's bring him back. Whenever you guys want. There's nothing more than talking it. I love than talking about my own opinions. <laughs> a smart friend of mine, as a smart friend of mine once said, when I said, if you want to know my opinion, and he said, well, whose opinion would you be giving me then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was definitely fantastic. So Matt, thank you so much for your time. And of course, David, uh, thank you so much for uh, bringing Matt on the show today. Do you have any closing thoughts for today? No, I guess, you know, this is our last podcast for 2020. So just want to thank, uh, you know, for, for the, for the folks that have been listening as we've grown um, and wish everybody, uh, you know, a, a healthy and happy holiday. You know, we're obviously at a very difficult moment, but I am hopeful for 2021, um, you know, just given where we're looking at with, with vaccines and whatnot. So I'm looking forward to a, a brighter, brighter year ahead, but I appreciate, you know, all our, our listeners and supporters. Um, and, and it's been great work working with you this year. And, and again, Matt, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on, the, for coming on. Awesome. Yeah. Really, really appreciate both your time. Thanks guys. Absolutely. And David, thanks. I can't echo that enough. It has been a pleasure working with you and I, I, I feel privileged to be able to be in this seat every time we get together and learn from people like Matt, learn from you, of course, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the audience is also learning along the way with us. So I want to thank you, the listening audience, for tuning in and listening to the Commentary Podcast with David Bodemer. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when David comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your colleagues. And again, we're all looking to connect in some way, shape, or form. And for 2021, this is one more way you can connect, share this podcast, and then have a conversation about what you learn. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at NREI, this is Eric Johnson inviting you back in the new year for all the stories that matter to you. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Common Area Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of NREI or Informa. The content has been made available for information and educational purposes only. Today's podcast was brought to you by Ryan, liberating our clients from the burden of being overtaxed, freeing their capital to invest, grow, and thrive.